Well, I concluded that Freud's influence in this respect has been absolutely decisive. Um, Jung, his great disciple, tried to find his way around this position Freud had adopted and tried to find a more religious, a more spiritual interpretation of the psyche, which is one of the reasons Freud and Jung fell out with one another. Most other followers of Freud and the schools that followed the po post-Freudians simply assumed that Freud was correct about the connection between the psyche and the natural environment. And the result of that is that if you look at psychiatric literature uh, as a whole, there's almost no mention in it of the non-human world, as if it just doesn't matter. Indeed, you find extreme examples of this uh, in a development following uh, World War II existential therapy, for example. It is simply assumed that human beings exist in a condition of alienation from nature. Indeed, that's the key problem that you have to address yourself to, our profound alienation as human beings in a, um, an alien universe. Well, I decided to go back beyond Freud and then to place his work within a larger framework of spiritual healing, psychotherapy in the most general sense of the term. Because if you look beyond the modern Western schools of psychiatry, uh, you find that in traditional societies among primary people, the people we once used to call primitives, that it is understood that sanity and madness have to be defined always in relationship to the natural habitat. And that indeed, to a very large extent, madness is understood to be an imbalance between the individual and the natural environment, or between an entire tribe or a people and its natural environment. Uh, that's a much larger conception of what sanity and madness are. And so my feeling is that the indigenous cultures have a lot to offer our understanding of sanity and madness in this one significant respect that there has to be a balance between the psyche and the natural mm -hmm. world around us. That, I think, has profound ecological implications. Well, one of the really controversial issues in modern psychiatry and psychology is, is the whole issue of uh, the social system itself. What happens when the social system is mad or insane? Yeah. Can you have sane people? Yeah, Freud also addressed himself to this issue, asking the question, how do we define madness if we decide, if we suspect that an entire culture may be um, Im embedded in what he called collusive madness uh, or communal neuroses, uh, where does the therapist then look for a baseline to define sanity and madness? Freud raised this issue. He never came up with a successful answer to it. Later schools like radical therapists have. Mm -hmm. They have called into question the existing social definition of madness uh, and sanity in ways that have profound social implications. Perhaps an entire society is mad, in which case you don't simply want to adjust people back into another condition of, of madness. Uh, the way in which I take this issue up is to suggest that there is a madness involved in urban industrial society that has to do with our lack of balance and integration with the natural environment, that this might be an interesting baseline to use for the definition of sanity as we move into the next century. Mm -hmm. That is, we need to recapture that sense of being embedded in nature, being in a condition of reciprocity with nature that you do find in traditional forms of healing. Now, I don't think we can ad simply ad ad adopt any other culture's conception of sanity and madness. We have to work out our own. Mm -hmm. And that, I want to suggest, is as much a job of the ecologist as it is of the therapist. So eco-psychology is the term I've used to try to define a common ground between two fields that have so far not been on mm -hmm. speaking terms, psychologists on the one side and ecologists on the other. Psychology needs ecology. Ecology needs psychology. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you know, Someday we wouldn't use a term like eco-psychology. Psychology would be understood to have an ecological framework. Mm -hmm. But at this point, that is still to be worked out. Well, at this point, <coughs> we have ecologists who uh, are like prophets in the wilderness uh, warning us that the course our civilization is taking on a global basis is madness, that, mm -hmm. that we're headed for self-destruction, that we are fouling our, our habitats. I've been concerned about the fact that <clears throat> many environmentalists have been sounding of very few notes in appealing to the public. Uh, they refer to fear, they refer to guilt, 
They seek to shock. They seek to shame. I understand why. The problems are urgent, and I mm -hmm. accept the urgency of these problems. I don't question that at all. But it may be important to ask at some point whether we've done too much of that in the environmental movement, which I consider myself to be a part of, and that perhaps we have to find other themes to introduce, other notes to sound, uh, that are more <laughs> positive and more affirmative. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, this becomes a challenge to the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. Do we believe? that human beings are bonded to this planet in a way that would allow us to invoke trust, love, respect, reciprocity as positive motivations for becoming good environmental citizens? Or do we believe there's nothing more to fall back on than duty based upon guilt, based upon shame? Uh, guilt and shame have their place, but an appeal that is exclusively related to guilt or to shame is, I think, at a certain point, going to have detrimental effects. It's going to turn people off. It's going to sound terribly negative and challenging in that bad sense in which you uh, confront people with a problem greater than they can take hold of. Mm -hmm. I would like to see the environmental movement ask itself this question. Are we not bonded to this planet by something which is life-enhancing and life-affirming? and which we can appeal to people to find within themselves a voice of the earth which speaks to them with a sense of love, respect, and trust. Mm -hmm. I suppose ultimately the question is which will be more effective. The environmentalists see that there's a job to be done mm -hmm. and they're probably using the means that they believe to be the most effective right now and I hear you challenging them. Well, one way to decide this is to simply recognize that the truth has to be told. To begin with, if we're dealing with problems that are urgent and um, life-threatening, uh, threatening the lives of other species uh, beyond our own, you simply have to say that. If it's true, it's true. You know, in many cases, we're not sure that it's true. We're troubled, perhaps, because of the uncertainty of the problem, and we have to invoke prudence more than certainty in, in the matter. But in addition to that, even if the problem is an urgent one. You still, I, at some point, I feel, have to connect with something more positive and affirmative in people. And I believe it's there. I wouldn't be saying this if I didn't believe it was there. So my article of faith is that at a very deep level, the human psyche is grafted to the planet out of which we evolved, that there is what I call an ecological unconscious. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever we invoke the unconscious, the depths of the unconscious, what we're essentially doing is pursuing a philosophical discussion of human nature. We're asking what makes people tick? What are the foundations of human behavior? And there's been, of course, a lot of speculation about that throughout the psychi throughout psychiatric uh, the, the tradition. Um, as some people find sexuality there. Others find the archetypes of uh, the high religious traditions there. Uh, I'm suggesting that at a certain level of the unconscious mind, what we find is ecological wisdom. And that indeed, if that were not there, our species could not have survived and evolved uh, as it has. Um, exactly what the ecological unconscious is and how it asserts itself and makes itself known, that's perhaps yet to be discovered once we attend to the problem. But I have floated this phrase, suggested this phrase as a hypothesis, so that the lowest level, the deepest level of the unconscious mind we find an ecological unconscious, deeper down even than Freud's ideas about sexuality or Jung's ideas about religious archetypes, something that connects us intimately, companionably, with the flora and fauna, the mountains, the rivers, the natural world around us. Well, it would seem to be a pretty logical and sensible thing when you think that we each carry within our bodies the genetic codes that have evolved over billions of years on this planet and are applicable to all other living systems. Well, I think that's one way to, to look at it, you know, that we carry within ourselves this heritage, which takes the form of the genetic code. And then the question is to what degree that affects the psyche. Uh, is the psyche not itself a, uh, an evolutionary phenomenon? I believe that it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, for that matter, even Freud believed that it was. In fact, f one of the things that made Freud feel most scientific was the degree to which he could rely upon Darwin and evolution. But Freud had a very skewed idea about Darwin and evolution. Freud was very much of a social Darwinist. His image of um, uh, uh, early uh, humanity was a primal horde uh, made up of rapacious, savage people, perhaps rather the Victorian vision 
of primitive people in the in darkest Africa. You know, there's a lot more of a personal projection in mm -hmm. that than, than real science. So Freud's use of Darwin and his use of evolution was um, kinked, it was distorted. But if we um, take the same tack that he did, that the human psyche must have evolved out of that kind of a mm -hmm. uh, background that it has behind it um, thousands of years of evolutionary development, then it's reasonable to assume that it does connect in intimate and significant ways with the natural environment out of which we evolved and that that's there to be found. And that the essence of sanity, in this case as in all cases, is tapping the deep unconscious. But the question is what you find there. And in eco-psychology, what you're looking for is our bond with the natural world.